Hi, everybody. I'm Debbie Montgomery Johnson, founder of the nonprofit The Woman Behind the Smile, and your host of Stand Up and Speak Up, a show that is about each and every one of us. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something not through no fault of our own or through our own making we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps us grow, and while it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Regardless of what your personal experiences or traumas have been, this showcase series is designed to ignite the light in you, as well as providing safe harbor, education, personal growth, and resources so that no matter where you are on your journey, you'll have the courage to move on when you're ready. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who've been through extraordinary situations and struggles and found the courage to step out from behind their smiles and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from those experiences. Everybody heals at a different pace, and we recognize that. So come on in, have a listen, and enjoy the ride at your own speed. Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful day in paradise, and I love to say that for my Canadian friends because today is actually going to be a rainy day, but for my flowers, it's a beautiful day in paradise. And I started this morning off thinking about the show, thinking about what I wanted to do, and I was ra- running around in my kitchen making lunch for my husband, and I was just bragging to myself because I was talking to my mom the other day about boiled eggs. And I had made these hard-boiled eggs for lunch, and I was getting ready to peel them, and I was like, oh, I was just bragging to mom that I can peel my hard-boiled eggs like in two bits. They just come right off, and there's a way I do it. And I was getting ready to do it this morning, and the first egg I did, it, I cracked it, and it just peeled one millimeter at a time. It just cracked and cracked and cracked, and I could not get that hard-boiled egg open. I'm thinking, this is not the way I want to start my morning. So I had a half an egg left after I peeled it, and then I get my second egg, and I crack it, and off come the peel in two bits. I'm thinking, well, heck, that was easy. That's the way it's supposed to, supposed to be. How did I do it differently? Well, you can imagine, the next two and three eggs, one cracked awful, one cracked easy, and I'm thinking, this is life. This is my conversation with Werner today (laughs) about cracked (laughs) eggs. And sometimes it's easy, and sometimes it's not. So I want to introduce my guest today. My new best friend for the day is Werner Berger, and he's here from Pennsylvania. Werner, are you with me? I am with you. I'm so Thanks glad you're here today. I, I've got to tell our, our audience, I have, we've not met in person. I feel like I meet you. I've met you in person. We've been in different groups. I've watched you over the years, uh, especially when you got in, involved with Awakening Giants. I was on the San Diego trip. But part of me was a little bit intimidated or, I don't want to say scared because I don't get scared of people, but I'm thinking, wow, he is really some awesome man. He's a successful CEO of a company. He's done these incredible adventures around the world. And so part of me is like, okay, so back off a little bit and just keep watching him. Well, about a couple weeks ago when we did an Awakening Giants and we did training, I listened to your training and thinking, Deb, just jump on it. Just call him up and say, hey, would you be my guest? Because he's got so much to add to the people listening to the show. So, Werner, thank you so much for saying yes. <laughs> and totally my pleasure, Debbie. And in well, fact, when I heard you, I also reached out to you. I think we did that simultaneously. We did, and how exciting was that? And it's just an honor because I... Uh, I, am, I have a very special relationship with my mom and dad, and they're 87 and 92. And I, I judge everybody's age by my, my, my dad, who's in great shape. He works for me. He's the Dr. Jack of the company. And I'm looking at the stuff that you've been doing, and I'm thinking, you know what? Age has no barrier if we don't let it. And so we're going to jump right into that because you've done some extraordinary things, but like I always do with my, my special guests, we're going to go back, Warner, a few years, to when you were young. And I want to know, where did you grow up? What was your family like? Brothers and sisters, siblings, and that kind of stuff. And I want to hear a little bit about your childhood before we jump into your youth. Okay, grew up in South Africa, 
in fact, was born in Johannesburg. Before the Second World War, my parents were immigrants from Germany. And in 1939, I was two and a half. My dad actually ended up being interned for six, six years, which also means, you know, I didn't see him for that length of time because kids and parents were not allowed to be put together. However, got along really well with my mom. And then, and I had a, a slightly old, older brother, 17 months older, and we, we were in good shape. And then my dad came home, and this stranger came into our lives. And it didn't take long before I really started disliking this man. And over the next few years, my brother and I got fighting with each other a lot. In fact, we even moved from Johannesburg to a farm in the far northern reaches of the country because my dad had the, that option of moving north, getting out of Johannesburg, or being repatriated to Germany. So for eight years, I became a farm kid. Uh, no, I should have said at age eight, I became a farm kid. And in fact, for eight years, because um, after high school, I went to university in Johannesburg, um, still really disliking this man and didn't really realize that I was playing life from I'm not good enough. I'm not measuring up. I'm not the tough guy that he is or the autocratic person that he is. And of course, that's what I should be because that's what men are supposed to be. And um, ended up really seeing myself as a nice guy, but I also saw myself as a wimp. Ended up in all kinds of athletic endeavors, loved sports because it really was my way out. And in fact, I remember very distinctly at age 18 thinking to myself, if I hurt myself to the point that I can't do my sports, I would end up killing myself. So one university degree wasn't enough. I had to get a second one and I had to get a third one. Um, and in retrospect, looking back, is because I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted to do with life. And just going back to school, not only was it fun, but it also was an escape. Then after my MBA degree, I had, had the opportunity, excuse me, <clears throat> of taking, the, taking over the running of a small company and grew this company 700% from 17 employees to 94 at its peak in seven years, which was really quite an accomplishment. But at the same time, I didn't have the sense of it being an accomplishment. In fact, um, at the end of those seven years, I really felt burnt out. And I thought, well, sell it off, retire, which I did actually another seven years later, um, because it took me seven years to really get out of it, since I didn't know where I was going. And um, instead of retiring to something, I retired from something. And that also had another impact, because over the next four years, I ended up finding myself completely in the gutter. I was married, had four kids, three of them of our own, one adopted, um, but then had to get back to doing something meaningful and useful. Totally by accident, and I hope you're not thinking this is too much, but I'll get to the end fairly quickly. No, no, I find it very intriguing. <laughs> okay, totally by accident, bumped into somebody that was running his own business under an umbrella company called the Performance Management Group. And this was a consulting firm um, really around people skills, how to run a business more effectively through um, ideal customers, linking properly with customers, dealing with employees the way they should be dealt with, and it was really easy for me to say, yeah, I want to do this. So I started running my own business, 
as a corporate consultant and it took me three years to really get to the point where I was generating sufficient income that I could be proud and happy with and worked in the long run with companies as large as AstraZeneca in Canada and also Clorox Canada in the leadership field. And how I got to the leadership part was I was working initially with customer service and then with mid management and then with sales and then just realized that nothing worked even though the courses were excellent and people would walk away saying this is the best thing that's ever happened to me and my business is going to be different and my life is going to be different because if we're not playing in a win-win game everything ultimately ends up in a lose-lose game. And everything was focused around creating win-win relationships. However, six months later, nine months later, people hardly remembered the name of the course, leave alone having implemented any of the skills. And what came to me is until the culture of an organization supports that kind or that way of being, Nothing can work. And that led me into the leadership part to really change corporate cultures. And um, at 55 or around 56, I had the first opportunity of climbing, of actually getting into the mountains and trekked to Everest Base Camp with one of my sons. And for me, that was a life-changing experience. Okay, we're going to get into that in a minute because there's a lot about the climbing that is really, really important. But as far as the the corporate culture and the leadership, I'm sitting here thinking about how I have responded to classes. And and I'm like those people you talked about. You know, you get gung-ho about a training that you go through, and then six months later, you're like, it's on on the shelf. You know, for me, it's hands-on. Um, it's like when I'm reading a book. I have the book in front of me. I'm highlighting with a highlighter, but I also love to listen to it in Audible, so I'm getting it in multiple ways. And then I will sit down and apply it, and I'll, I'll write about it. So there are so many ways that we need to learn, and classroom's important, but for me, <laughs> it was sitting down at my dad's knee and learning how to hammer hammer a nail or you know, put in a new dishwasher or something like that. It's, it's hands-on. And it's that experience that I think so many people miss out on, especially in school right now or in classes. It's the application part of it. So in this process, though, did you have, who were your mentors? Who was around you giving you advice, if you had any? Initially, I didn't have any. um, And then went to a workshop called Consultation Skills. And this was actually, that was, before I became a corporate consultant. And I just absolutely loved what they were talking about relative to communication skills, connecting with people, really focusing on the other person, really getting out of your own shell. And um, then when I got into the corporate consulting world, I had some phenomenal coaches and some phenomenal processes. So I did not develop the processes a corporation out of Eden Prairie, Minneapolis, called the Wilson Learning Corporation, came up with these fabulous, fabulous programs. And in fact, they were they were workshops because we would be with corporate leaders for five days, and they were actually practicing what they were doing. But the transition into the workplaces where ultimately things died Mm -hmm. and you know I really started realizing through my climbing why and as he said we'll get into that okay when you uh, you mentioned that when you retired you retired from something instead of to something and then you felt like you were hitting rock bottom that you you know you were in the gutter at that point yeah was there someone there to help you out of that or what where was your mindset at that point how did you rise up from that to take your next step up step up well I didn't do a great job actually at that I did do um, some therapy 
In fact, it was supposed to be a form of primal therapy. And I had read a lot about Arthur Janoff's work on primal therapy and um, reconditioning the cellular memory because our struggles really don't just exist within our brains. They exist in every single cell of our body because any traumatic experience, any happy experience actually launches itself into our system, not only into our brain. And um, somehow that did not work for me. It was interesting. Last week you were on the show with me with Akshay Nanavati, and Akshay did that seven days of darkness. Yes. And I'm thinking... I don't know that I could do that. And But as you were talking about this primal reconditioning, that would certainly change you from the inside out, being in the dark for seven days. And from my perspective, I might just say that that would be an excellent way of really getting into yourself and getting to know who you are and getting to the bottom of who is this person and why would I be afraid of the dark? I'm with me. Yeah. ultimately. Anyway, uh, yeah. side issue. <laughs> no, that's true. But as he said, you know, as long as he can take that quiet pause and concentrate on that and not exercise or try to be busy to make the time go by. So yep. in your particular case, though, now we're going to jump into the, into the climbing because I was trying to get when, when you were a child, did you do any climbing as a kid? Always playing because the our... We, as I said, I was a farm kid, and our farm was against a mountain. It wasn't a steep mountain. It was reasonably tall. Um, but just in the course of being a kid and doing things, yes, I did some climbing. But, you know, whether I was climbing or pole vaulting in, in the backyard, or <laughs> actually in those days we were still shooting birds, or shooting okay. birds, you know, it was just an activity. And, of course, right now, thinking back, I despise the fact that I would do that, have done that. But, you know, I did that just the way that I despise that I hated my dad so much because mm. in later life I'm seeing, you know, what an amazing human being this guy was and what the, his trials and tribulations were. It's just, it's just wild what we do unintentionally, not just harming ourselves, but harming the environment and not knowing. Did you ever develop a relationship with your dad? No, not before he died. No. It's only afterwards that I started seeing, you know, how amazing he was. And, and that, how how hooked he was too in in terms of his own yeah. um issues. That's one of the things that as I've gotten older I've I've really appreciated spending time and listening to my parents, listening to the stories and asking them questions, you know, because I, I talked to dad one time about finances and I said, Pop, did you ever talk to your parents about money? He goes, no. And I know my, my mom's side of the house, it was like, oh, we never talk about money. We don't talk about those things. And then if we don't talk about them, we'll never learn about them. Right. And I'm very open with my kids about things, and they ask me, you know, I was just in Hawaii visiting one of them, and he goes, Mom, do you have all of your end-of-life stuff put together? I'm like, uh, yes, you don't have to worry about that. But years ago, I might not have, and many of us don't, because I, I remember talking to my father-in-law about this one time when he was, he was in, um, going into hospice, and his kids were fighting with each other because nobody knew what Dad wanted. And I'm thinking, I've lost a husband. You know, I've been through this, guys, and all you have to do is sit down and talk to him. I ended up being the one to sit down and talk with him and said, look, I know you don't want to talk about this because it makes you feel like you have one foot in the grave, but once we get it all talked about and written down and taken care of, we'll never have to talk about it again. And we did that, and I sent it off to his kids, and when he passed, everything was smooth. I'm thinking, why don't we do this more often? And, and why don't we talk to our wise, like the wow women, women of wisdom, men of wisdom, our elders, because they've been through what we're going through. And another reason why I wanted to have you on my show is you're a few years older than I am, but you've got so much wisdom, Warner, that you've learned from life and from your climbing. So let's jump into climbing and, and what was the impetus of it 
And then where was your favorite birthday? <laughs> I, was, I was in a self-development workshop in 1989. And the guy in front said, think of three things that you would love to do before you die, but you probably never will. And what came to me is climb Kilimanjaro, because this, I'm, now, I'm now a Canadian, and this was in Canada, um, because I was born on the African continent. Uh, climb the Matterhorn, because everybody knows this beautiful mountain in Switzerland, and see Everest Base Camp. Because in 1953, when Hillary and Tensing got to the top of, Kiliman, of um, Everest, I was so intrigued. And, you know, I got this news probably three, four weeks after they had reached the top. And the other kids, nobody had much of a sense of what this meant. Um, but I was thrilled by it. And this has been in my mind ever since, you know, oh, my gosh, what a, what a feat, what an accomplishment. And sitting there and, and deciding those were the three things that I would love to do before I die. Went home, talked to my family about it, everybody chuckled, and everybody forgot about it except me and one of my sons. Because three years later, my son Paul said, Dad, you wanted to see Everest Base Camp, why don't we go? So I went. Oh, we went. And we had an amazing time. And I realized literally months later, when, after coming back, that every time I thought of it, looked at photos, or talked about it, this glow came up within me. And there were days that, that I was literally floating or had a sense of floating, but hadn't yet really tied it to the climb. But then one day I just realized that something had shifted there. And what it shifted is I had received a sense of what is it like to be completely in the present, day after day after day. The only thing you're thinking about is the next step. What are you putting into your backpack? What do you need to do to stay warm? What do you need to do to, to, to strip down? Because even in very cold conditions, climbing generates a lot of heat. And so you're constantly focusing on what does this body need? What does this body need? What does this body need? And that, for me, translated into, into a couple of things. One is being very, very clearly aware of the environment and really, truly being linked to the environment and, and just being mesmerized by the beauty of this planet. The other thing is, as I mentioned, having a sense of what does it feel like to be just totally in this moment. And then the other part was just a sense of appreciation of not just everything, but people and everything within. And as a result, just realized that there had been some shift within me. And we'll talk about this, if you wish, in terms of leadership a little bit later or now. Absolutely. Well, that's the value of immersion and putting yourself into a situation. And many people would say, well, you know, I've got life. I can't do this. I can't get away. Uh, I remember it's taking me back to when I was 15 and I, I was in school, but I did a, a summer over in France living with a, with a French family. And I, the intent was to go over there to learn French, but of course, you know, being a 15-year-old American, you wanted to hang with your American friends. But my French family, from the minute I got there, only spoke French to me. And, and I, I knew a lot, but not, not everything I needed. So it got very frustrating for me. And I, knew, I remember I was sitting up in, I had the top floor of their home, and I would write in my journal, and I would listen to American music, and then I would listen to some French music. But at the end, I got so frustrated that they, they, they weren't you know, capitulating and speaking to me, but I realized that I learned so much more from them not speaking any English to me. I didn't even know they knew English until the last day. And then I found that they were all fluent in English. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I hope I didn't say anything. 
that offended them. Um, but it was that total immersion in their in their family, in their culture, uh, that I learned the most. And I'm visualizing you on your climb. I mean, I I think I told you one time that I would be freezing just thinking about it. But as you were explaining to me the you do build up heat as you're walking and, and doing whatever. So what did you do to prepare for that trip? Because you just up and went. You and your son, it was, how long were you gone? A couple weeks? I don't even remember exactly. That particular one was about 21 days. How did you prepare yourself for those 21 days? Oh, I knew that it would be fairly arduous and um, spent a lot of time on, on three elements, actually, on cardio, on leg strength, and on core strength. So I was really in good physical shape when I got there. And even so, with altitude and being in good shape, we probably went faster than, oh, I shouldn't say probably, we went much faster than the normal people would go. And so, you know, we got to total exhaustion points, or I more so than my son. Why did you go faster? Was that, was that a goal of yours, or you just, you just did it? We just did it. We just did it. We would get to where most people would get to at the end of a day, and we'd know that the next um, village would be two hours further, and we'd say, do we go? Yes. Boom. So we went. So we covered um, eight days and six, the two of us. Now, you, how many people were with you? Just, uh, just my son and I. And then a couple of people along the way joined us, and some dropped off, and some stayed with us. Um, you didn't yeah. have a guide with you at that point, just the two of you? Yeah, we did not go with a guide. Now, when I take people, we actually go with a guide and with porters, because we were carrying all of our own gear. Now we don't. We carry about 15, 20 pounds, okay. many rations of what you need during the day, and the porters carry the the main load from one sleeping place to the next sleeping place. What a bonding experience that must have been for you and your son. Extreme. And in fact, um, my son and I, this particular son, we were extremely close until about age 12. And then we got into all kinds of conflict because I didn't know about leadership. I didn't know about parenting, not much at least, more than maybe most people because we didn't do certain things that most families do. But that was my wife's influence. She was a very, very strong influence on how we parented. But anyway, I would keep doing things with and to Paul that I would do with him as a young kid. And of course, <clears throat> that came across as me controlling him to him, not realizing. I was thinking, oh, I wasn't consciously thinking. That's one of the problems. Um, I, my, my rationale was I'm saving him from hardships instead of allowing him to learn the lessons. And, of course, that came across, as I said, as control, and that created alienation. And I, when we came back from this trip to Everest Base Camp, Everything had shifted. Everything had changed. And we're really, really in, in great shape now and have been literally ever since that trip. Were there times on that, on that trek with him that he would be the one saying, come on, Dad, you can do it, you can do it? Or did it go back and forth? Did, did, were you the one that was doing it? Who was the primary encourager in that group? There was no leader. No leader. Nope. We just... I don't know. Somehow we just meshed. There was no, you know, let's do it this way. No, no, let's do it this way. We just flowed. Does one person go first and then the other follows and then maybe you switch off or how to? He, he was generally in front okay. because he was, um, I definitely struggled more than he did physically. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I, I, read, um, I read an article that was written um, years ago, and, and you said this, a good leader can sometimes be like a good parent. 
strict in terms of what the expectations and the agreements are, but always considerate of the other person and how they feel. The minute I damage that feeling, I've got somebody that's going to avoid me whenever they can, and they'll start disrespecting me because I've stepped on their toes. Maybe it was unintentional, but that's the damage and that's the problem. A few leaders intend to damage their people, and yet they do it because they don't know any better because they haven't gone through their inner journey. They haven't found and grounded themselves in their magnificence. In fact, so it's not selfish. In their magnificence, they need to ground themselves. So thinking, there were times probably where, where you had gone through this process, where, and I have too as a parent, where I think I'm doing something for one of my kids and it was totally the wrong thing to do and, and I didn't allow them to learn for, themsel for themselves and we had had words and I'm not a person of conflict and I, I don't think you probably are either. Um, so out of love, we're trying to protect, maybe control, <laughs> but at some point you have to let that go and that's, I am assuming, something that uh, you and your son learned from that trek. Well, just bridging on what you said, the other thing that kicks in is if we're not people of conflict, very frequently we step back and we mm -hmm. give in to the point where we no longer can and get angry, or, and I'm talking about myself here, get angry, and instead of coming across as gentle and friendly and, and as a coach, I came, come across as an autocrat. Mm because I'm now in reaction. I'm no longer in my rational space because of getting hooked. And that's where the damage comes in. And people don't like autocrats. Of course not. We don't <laughs> like being told what to do. We don't like being controlled. Unless, of course, we very in the, in the formative phase, we don't mind people telling us what to do because we don't really know what we should be doing once, let's say, we've associated with them in a business setting. They set the path. They decide wh what has to be accomplished, and they have a sense of how to do it. I'm a rookie. I don't know. So they can tell me, you know, do this, do this, do this, and when you finish doing that, do this, and that's fine. But when I get into the normative phase, the next phase of my growth, which in a, in a family would be the independent phase. A kid wants to become independent. If I don't let go of what I did during the dependent phase of that kid or of my employee, resentment starts building up because immediately I think you don't trust me. Yeah. Then you have the other side of it where the strong one doesn't want your help. And I think sometimes I got into that position where I'm like, hey, I, I'm the self-sufficient one. Leave me alone. <laughs> I probably would have benefited from help at that point. So what do you do with that one? You know, I think you called it the macho mode that people get into. Yeah, I learned that one on the mountain too because um, on Mount Kilimanjaro, somebody was really struggling. And I said to her, Jennifer, give me your pack. And she said, no. And I said, look, give me your pack. And she struggled and struggled and struggled. And an hour later, I said, give me your pack. And she said, no. And she kept struggling. And I got frustrated by that. I, didn't, I hope I didn't show it. But internally, it said, why would you be so hard-nosed? And then on, Kiliman, on Mount Everest, I had a period of really struggling. And one of the guides said, give me some of your weight. And every instinct said, no. I came here to prove myself, and that, of course, is the problem, and I did not realize that. A lot of my climbing was to prove myself to me that I was okay. Anyway, and I thought back of that situation on Kilimanjaro and said, okay, this is stupid. I will give him some of my weight, and I did at one point. So <laughs> I had learned something. Well, and... and I mean, how many, how many people have died thinking that they can do it on their own? Oh, there are lots of deaths on the high mountains. On the mountains. And, and yeah. you've climbed, well, you've got the Guinness World Record for climbing, what, the top mountains on every continent? Yeah, the highest mountain on every The highest mountain. mountains. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and that was at, by your age, or how how did they come across, uh, about with that world record? Yeah, yeah, by age. I was the oldest person to have accomplished what is called the seven summits, and actually there's an eighth that becomes part of the seven, and I know that's confusing because the mountain in Australia is just a little pipsqueak of a mountain. It's 7,200 <laughs> feet. And when I was nearing the summit, there were families with babes in arms that were coming from the summit. It's such an easy walk up. Um, so the serious climbers replace that mountain, although that is the highest point on that continent, with a mountain called Karsten's Pyramid um, in Indonesia, because it's still part of the Australasian shelf. Um, and that is the eighth. And by the time I did the eighth, I was 76. And that kicked me into the record as the oldest person to have accomplished those seven. At one point, did you strive to get that record, or did it? How did that come about? It just happened. It just happened. Um, after coming off McKinley the first time, and that was in 1995, we did not get to the summit because when we got to the summit ridge, which was only 200 vertical feet, 70 yards from the top, <laughs> along a very gentle ridge that takes 20 minutes, we could not continue on because we got into really high um, winds, gusty winds, and the temperature was well below minus 40. And the worst part is that that wasn't too bad. We could have handled that. But the worst part is cloud was moving in. And we could not afford to get caught in a whiteout. So we had to, are we going to risk the 20 minutes to the summit and back before we can go down? Or do we go down and come back another day? We decided as a team to go down. And um, that, that was smart because otherwise, you know, the getting caught in a whiteout at that altitude with our bodies not being acclimatized and having to spend overnight in those freezing, windy conditions would not have been very smart. At the time, though, did you experience any disappointment? You're so no, close. No, none. None. None? Because when we came home, most people said, how could you quit? Not, not most people, some people. How could you quit when you're that close to the top? And everything inside of me screamed, we didn't quit. We didn't quit. This was the most amazing experience I've ever had. And now I can go back and do it again. So in that, I learned the journey absolutely is the destination. If you allow it to be. And if your ego doesn't get in the way. Mm. I'm thinking of the book uh, Three Free from Gold, and huh. that that perspective would be like, oh, you'd quit. <laughs> you were so close. You were 200 feet away. But I read I read your your rendition of it, and and that is so true. You're you're looking around and it, look how far you got. It was the beauty of that of that. And then you could go back and how much um, how much more passion and confidence did you have the next time up? A lot more. Actually, I had lots of confidence even at, at this, at, with the first attempt. So it wasn't a case of confidence. It was really a case of, of just the enjoyment of the effort, um, knowing that we are going to be dog-tired at certain times, especially after we got to our campsite and then had to go and shovel snow and ice to create a, a, a tent platform. Um, and, and just being in that environment and, and just being one with nature, I found was a little on the, maybe not a little, was on the addictive side. Mm. And I didn't have to get to the top. It was not about the accomplishment. Although by the time I went for the, for the third time, I definitely wanted to get to the top. 
And again, nature almost got in the way again because it was nature that stopped us every other time because we should have had a rest day at high camp before going for the summit. And we knew that weather was moving in, so we didn't do our rest or acclimatization day, but went for the summit. And made but you were wise, though. I'm, I'm thinking of, of others that might have gotten to that point of being reckless because they want to get to the top, they want to get to the top, and they're not looking, and this is life too, we're not looking around us at the dangers that could be coming at us or around us. We're just focused, just laser focused on that one goal. And yeah. sometimes that one goal is not the right thing for us. Most people who die on Everest die on the way down. Explain that. Well, first of all, they overexerted themselves. So instead of being really um, steady and strong on the way down, they're not. Um, it's also more dangerous climbing down because going up, all your weight is on your toes and on your, your front crampons. Stepping down, especially on steep slopes, your weight generally is on the back on, on your heels where you don't have the number of crampons and you're leaning back. So it's very easy for that foot to slip out. Mm. And especially if you, you're really fatigued or, or not concentrating or not completely present, that's when, when accidents happen. So it's, it's a complete journey. It's the up and the down. It's not just get to the top. And I mean, I saw pictures of you on top. It's extraordinary on top of Kilimanjaro or um, on any of them, I would imagine. Explain to us the feeling that you had when you're up there. And I don't know how long you can stay up there because of the cold. But what's the feeling you had looking out at the world? It varies depending on, first of all, what you see, because when we got to the top of Everest and I got there at eight minutes past eight in the morning, we'd climbed from high camp through the night. Cloud had already built up, excuse me, <clears throat> in the lower regions, so there wasn't much to see except the odd mountain peak that stuck through the cloud. But I had another um, element that I was focused on brought some kites. So I ended up flying a kite on Everest. So <laughs> cool. I wasn't completely present to the environment other than focus on flying my kite, <laughs> which was fun. But it might have been a little bit stupid because just being there might have had a different feeling. But I'm not regretting anything. <laughs> Um, and ultimately, it's not about getting to the top. It really is about the effort getting there. My deepest sense of experience and and being truly touched was when we got to when I got. I was behind the, the rest of the team. I got to the south summit and looked across the traverse, saw the Hillary Step, which is a steep little section that people know about who are climbers, and saw the slope all the way up to the summit and could see the summit about an hour away. And the weather was fairly calm. Um, the sky was really black because uh, at that altitude, <laughs> it's, it's a different sky. And... Um, it was about seven, yeah, it was seven o'clock in the morning, and knowing that this was going to be the day that I'm going to stand on top of the world, that's when I had a really, really strong emotional reaction. And even now when I'm talking about it, I can still feel that, that reaction. That was much stronger than being on top. But then being on top, of course, I had my activity with a kite, which took some of my attention away from just being it's like doing the push-ups in the dark. Well, I'm going to have a different feel, a different thought about when I hear Mary Poppins sing, "Let's Go Fly a Kite." <laughs> <laughs> now I have, now I have a vision of you on top of the mountain. How fun is that? Uh, it, I, I, I can just imagine the feeling. You, I mean, I, I'm, I'm never going to do that. I'm going to tell you, I, I never say never, but I will never do that. Sorry. Um, 
but it's that Tinkerbell moment that's that when I when I went up on a challenge course and uh, and jumped off of a off of a pole and caught a trapeze and I'm hanging there you know 40 50 60 feet above the ground and I'm having this Tinkerbell moment just thinking wow this is the coolest thing ever and just thinking about it I I can feel it I can feel it all over again it's been years since I did that but like now I'm looking at you flying the sky on Everest. It's just like what a cool moment. And um, <laughs> so, so Werner, I'm going to split this show up into a couple different parts. And I just I want to leave the audience with the feeling of flying a kite on top of Mount Everest. How fun, how cool, how exciting. Have that Tinkerbell moment. And just thank you so much for this time we've spent together. I really enjoyed it and I look forward to doing the next part of the show and hearing from our friend Deborah Morrison. So thanks everybody. Have a great day and we'll move on to the next section. Thanks for listening to Stand Up and Speak Up. We are dedicated to encouraging you to remove the mask of embarrassment and being your best self. If you've been a victim of a scam or cybercrime, please visit againstscams.org for assistance and guidance about options and recovery. SCARS, the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, is an incorporated nonprofit crime victims assistance organization based in Miami, supporting scam victims worldwide. If you can, please make a small donation to help the victims around the world receive the help that they need. This episode has been sponsored by BenfoComplete.com, a vitamin supplement company that supports happy and healthy hands and feet for those with neuropathy. If you or anyone you know struggles with the pins and needles or numbness in their hands and feet, Check out our Benfa teaming products at BenfoComplete.com and use the special code STANDUP for 5% discount on your purchase. Again, thanks everybody for being here with us today. Go to my website, TheWomanBehindTheSmile.com for additional information and resources. Check out my YouTube channel and subscribe and follow the replays of all of our great guests. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks very much for being here.